Kwe Galasvi Gopan. Hello, and we welcome you to the beautiful Blessed Kwe language. That is the language of the land that sustains us, the language of the Blessed Kwe peoples. Audrey is my name, and I go by the pronoun she. I am a student of the Advanced Studio Practice Program here at the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design. Today is our 10th lecture, and it's great to have Elizabeth Denerson as our guest speaker today. Heads up, the session is being recorded, and so by staying and participating, you are consenting to being recorded. A gentle reminder that you can be seen and heard. Please, if you haven't done so already, turn your microphones to mute to avoid feedback. If you are experiencing glitching, turning off your video can help. The opinions given are strictly those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect those of NBCCD, the ACC, or the Sheila Hugh Mackay Foundation. Lastly, I ask your patience and understanding with the technology as we all navigate this delivery mode and change of pace. To officially begin, we are going over Jean for the territorial acknowledgement. Thanks, Audrey. So on this unceded and unsurrendered territory where we live and work, the peace and friendship treaties were signed between 1725 and 1779 between the El Nu the Wulustagwiwik, the Passamaquoddy First Nations, and the British. And these peace and friendship treaties were the very first of their kinds to be signed between Indigenous nations and Western nations. And despite the efforts of the Canadian government since Confederation to assimilate and erase Indigenous peoples through acts and policies such as the Indian Act and the Residential Schools Act, Thankfully, Indigenous peoples and traditions continue to influence the Canadian political, cultural, social, and environmental landscape today. Thank you, Jean. Now over to Lee to tell us about the guest lecture series. Thanks, Audrey. Um, sponsored and made possible by the Sheila Hugh Mackay Foundation, this series is organized by the Advanced Studio Practice Program at the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design, and it's in partnership with the Atlantic Center for Creativity. And the purpose of the guest lecture series is to model successful contemporary practice to our students and to inform and inspire and ignite art and design dialogue and engagement in the greater public community. The uh, guest lecture series provides this by giving a platform for presentation, creating time for dialogue, and celebrating the creative and cultural riches that we have here in Atlantic Canada. Thank you, Lee. Now over to Joe to tell us about our partner, the ACC. Thank you, Audrey. The Atlantic Center for Creativity is an initiative that promotes creativity across disciplines. It has three main goals. One, to promote research and programming in the area of creativity and innovation. Two, offer events such as symposia, conferences, and workshops on a yearly basis for sharing ideas and information. And three, build partnerships in the area of creativity and innovation on a local, regional, and national basis. You can get additional information and check out the new online journal, Creativity Matters, by visiting the website Atlantic Center for creativity.com. Thank you, Joe. Now over to Ben for the guest lecture, guest speaker introduction, sorry. Thanks, Audrey. Today's speaker is <clears throat> Elizabeth Emerson, and her lecture is entitled Harvesting the Wild. Elizabeth Emerson talks about harvesting natural materials like rock and ash for utilizing in ceramic processes. Elizabeth Demerson is the coordinating instructor of the ceramics diploma program at NBCCD. Before teaching in ceramics, she was the coordinating instructor for indigenous visual arts. Liz has a master's of arts in social cultural anthropology from Concordia University, a bachelor of education and bachelor of arts, anthropology and women's studies from the Uni University of New Brunswick and a diploma in fine craft ceramics from NBCCD. Over to Liz. You're on mute. Sorry. 
That's okay. We have I forgot to I muted because there's all kinds of stuff going on here. Um, I'm in the ceramic studio and everyone is here having lunch and hanging out so they can they can be here live and I have it all posted up on a TV screen. They're firing a kiln so you're going to see lots of people coming and going. So thank you all for coming. Um, as you know, I'm Liz Demerson. Uh, I'm a ceramic artist, a potter, a teacher, a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister. I have a lot going on right now and life is very busy, but to be perfectly honest with you, it's always busy. It always has been and it always will be. Um, there've been times in, in my life where it's been both easier and more difficult to get into the studio to make. Um, at times it's been simply a deadline that gets me in there and other times it's been uh, a personal or an emotional need to be in there making and sometimes I've needed to take a break and take time away from making and those times have been actually the more difficult times in my life but those were the times that I had to really keep my goals clear. I figured today that the best thing for me to talk about is since I'm tuned into teaching and to um, students and to growth would be about my journey through the arts um, and, and about my current work right now in natural materials and ceramics. So I will start where I graduated from NBCCD in 2003. Um, before that, I had uh, my previous life, I talk about it that way, was a lot of education. Um, I had done a BA in UMB and an MA in anthropology at Concordia University. I wrote my master's thesis on body modification. I spent four months doing field research in downtown Montreal, spending time with people who were altering their bodies to suit their aesthetics through tattoos and piercings, uh, implants, branding, and various forms of cutting. I had taken a ceramics course before I moved to Montreal and I completely fell in love with it. So when I finished my MA, I decided that I needed to pursue it. And it really didn't hurt that all of the people around me were super supportive. My mom especially, and when I met my husband when I was a student here in 2002, Ryan, he, he was super supportive as well. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully it works. Um, let's see. It's very dark and nothing's happening. Okay. Can you see my. Yeah. Okay. Can okay, cool. <laughs> So my early, uh, my early years of production were filled with sleek, colorful pots, mugs, plates, teapots, a full functional line. I sold at the Boyce Farmers Market, at craft stores around the Maritimes in Ontario. I did wholesale shows and retail shows. I did craft sales around New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and I even did the one of a kind show uh, in Toronto one Christmas. I love doing craft sales. Uh, there's the excitement of producing for it, talking to people about my work, uh, helping them pick out gifts, and of course, being paid for making pottery. I did this for seven years. And during this time, I opened up my studio and my gallery at Hoyt House in King's Landing. Liz, I, sorry for interrupting. Your screen is on presenter view, and you might want to just oh, put it is. a slideshow so that we see the one slide for each screen. You slideshow? Hmm. You may need to exit. Yeah, there we go, that's fixed, thanks. Okay, so you can just see like it's bigger. Okay, awesome. Um, so uh, when I was at King's Landing, it was, I had no affiliation really with them. I was renting a space and so I didn't have to be historic or anything. And I have absolutely no pictures of this time. Um, I have a whole lot of these. I have a big stack of my pamphlets and uh, that's, that's it. I had a, a hard drive mishap and I lost 
lost all of my pictures, which is unfortunate. Uh, these now I use for labeling my glaze buckets. So yeah, so this was an extremely fun time though. I had this beautiful studio space. I had a big gallery section. I was able to work at my own speed, prepare for sales, wholesale shows and sell to the general public. I picked fresh flowers to display in pots and was able to arrange them on shelves. And my husband even dabbled a little in ceramics at the time. He liked to fire Raku in the yard. And customers would frequently come in and tell me that my garbage can was on fire. So <laughs> that was fun. Um, I had uh, also had a studio bunny named Raku and he was a free range bunny that entertained visitors. I learned a lot during that time. I didn't have any business training. Like we didn't, at NBCCD, we didn't give that business training at the time. And uh, so I had to learn a lot through trial and error. Um, I took some business courses through the CBDC um, and I tried not to take myself too seriously and learn from mistakes. And both of those things were difficult. <laughs> I had another line that I used to expand my interests in my market. I always had kind of a split focus on my aesthetics and this line gave me that. Uh, this one was all hand built and the other one was all wheel thrown. I also made masks. Um, I was able to do a few other things at the time. I dabbled a little bit in non-functional but functional work has always been my interest. Yep, this is me. Uh, two th around 2005, I, I, I'm not sure of the date exactly, in my basement studio. And uh, I decided to have a baby and do a teaching degree in 2008. And that changed everything. Uh, I still made pots, but not quite as much on such a large scale. I had my daughter, Anna, in 2008 uh, while doing my teaching degree. She went to class with me. And she sat in the studio with me while I worked, but we could only really do that for so long. Babies do eventually start to move. I finished my degree and then I began substitute teaching in the school system. And that was fun. It was probably one of the more challenging times in my life. I landed a few long-term contracts, but mostly I went from school to school. I started teaching a few classes at MBCCD in design and in communications. Um, the odd ceramics media class, as well as uh, some not for credit night classes. My husband was working in the morgue at the time and had decided that he had had enough of that. So we moved to Fort McMurray. So this is eight years later. Uh, at the Fort McMurray Potter's Guild, which was interestingly in the side room of a hockey arena. I was pregnant with my second child here and my husband would take our daughter to a hockey game and I'd go <laughs> into the studio and we were all happy. Um, I taught a few classes at the Guild and uh, I really just made pots in my spare time. I wasn't selling or anything. We were there for a year. And when I had my son, Theo, I knew that it was time to go home to New Brunswick. I really didn't like Fort McMurray. Uh, it never felt like home. So we returned to Fredericton and I began teaching in the IVA studio. It was then called AVA. Uh, and so I was an anthropologist and I had a unique perspective on teaching. One of learning while teaching. And it was, it was great, but ceramics was always calling my name. And I didn't have a whole lot of time for it because it's a pretty big undertaking running a studio. So ceramics took the back burner. I found some time to make some AVA mugs. <laughs> but, oh, it's not letting me move. What do I do? It's not letting me go to my next slide. Um, you might need to uh, just uh, go out, just uh, escape, exit, and then bring escape. it back up again. Well, let me do that either. Stop share. Yep. Try that. Stop if it share. Helped. Yep. And then reshare. Yep. Will okay. it will it cycle through on the screen before it's shared? 
Uh oh. Liz, do you see the little arrow? If you move to the bottom left hand corner of your oh. screen, there's an arrow. Now you want, yeah, now use the forward one. Yeah. Oh, there you, go. There you are. Okay. If you want to minimize this, you can be the Oh. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so in AVA, I was able to learn a whole lot of new mediums. I learned how to bead and make baskets and quill. Oh, this one. I'll figure yeah. it out. There we are. Um, we made drums. I learned how to carve wood and harvest sweet, sweet, sweet grass. We did pit firings, a large powwow, powwow drum, and even a mini birch bark canoe. This time opened me up to using and appreciating Mother Nature for all of her gifts. And it really made me see the natural world around me as a huge avenue for inspiration. Then I began teaching in ceramics in 2016, and I was able to completely focus on ceramics. But the inspiration from AVA and nature took me a little bit of time to see. But once I realized it and saw it, I dove straight in. And this brings me to my current journey in ceramics. I, I kind of feel like I need to tell you how I got here because it helps in the understanding on why on earth anyone will want to work with natural materials because it is so much more work. Um, it's just so much more work. <laughs> um, I remember being a student and having so many uh, negative thoughts, uh, self-doubt, how am I ever going to do this? How is this ever going to work? What am I going to do? How can I? How, where do I go from here? Um, now, looking back, if I'd known then what I know now, that all I really had to do was put one foot in front of the other and that my own stick to itiveness would take me somewhere. I probably wouldn't have wasted so much time worrying. The journey, the processes, the mundane daily bits and pieces, the ups and downs, the thinking, the rethinking about what you're going to do will actually take you somewhere interesting. So I did a lot of trial and error and I just made a whole lot of stuff and eventually things began to come together. So starting in ceramics in 2016 and starting all over again in my own work, all of those feelings of self-doubt start returning. I had the theory and the skill in my head and in my hands, but I had no focus. I had no sense of what I wanted to be doing creatively, but I did have that strong will and an ability to do experiments and a very curious nature. I also, again, had very supportive people around me. And one day, Peter Thomas handed a book to me, Natural Materials, Collecting and Making by Miranda Forrest. And he said, hey, Liz, we got a new book in. I think you'll find it interesting. Looking back, I kind of think he knew what he was doing. He was planting a bug in my brain. Maybe he didn't, but I kind of, looking back, I think he knew he could see it, but I was not there yet. And I looked at this book and I was immediately intrigued and I read it from cover to cover several times. And then I began doing experiments. And then those experiments turned into a whole lot of test tiles and the ceramic studio being filled with coffee cans and yogurt containers of ground up ashes, clays, various rocks, sands, and granites. I went on day trips and collected various materials to process and test in glazes. This particular trip to Minister's Island was very cold and very long. We called it the Death March because Theo got, that's my son, Theo, he got very cold and wet and I had to carry him back to the car for, it was longer than an hour, me carrying this crying, cold, wet child, as well as the seaweed and the seashells that I had collected. I brought everything back to the school and I began processing and testing and I learned a lot from it. Besides the glaze results, what I learned was that anything you collect from the ocean, you need to pre-fire or calcine before you use it in a glaze to kill the bacteria. 
there was more than one occasion that I opened up a container of Blaze only to stink up the entire studio with the smell of a rotten ocean. Now, most everyone in ceramics knows that I'm a pretty big glaze nerd. I love testing things and I love experimenting with materials. I am the one who arranges those field trips to silica mines and to dig up clay and plant matter. And I am actually genuinely excited by it. Uh, we end up bringing all these materials back and then begin processing. It's difficult to see where it's going to go when you're faced with 20 pounds of clay to process or dried corn stalks or seaweed to burn. And you have to figure out how you're gonna do it, where you're gonna do it. But the love of that process is really what keeps you going. And once the students see, you can actually make a glaze out of it. Oh, I thought I heard something. Um, they get into it and they get excited about it too, I hope so. <laughs> Collecting is a lot of fun too. I've never really had, a, well, I guess I shouldn't say that. I haven't had too bad of an experience collecting. Minister's Island was a little rough, but for the most part, I've, it's all been really excellent experiences. Even when stupid things happen, you can still have a good laugh. I fell in a pile of clay. Um, and just being able to come home and make something with that material is really rewarding. And this is clay from Mac to Quack. I do think the concept of just trying to see what will happen with no strings attached and no expectations, just an academic exercise to see what we'll actually learn from it is refreshing. I've spent a lot of time learning the theory and the science of various glaze materials that we use in ceramics. So when you start to apply them to found materials, it's not that difficult. We put it in the kiln and see what will happen. How does it fit with the glaze theory? How can I utilize the material? You always learn something new and you get a sense of that material and begin to think about how you can use it. It just follows. Will it give you the effect you want? What can I do to it? What can I add to it to make it do what I want? It's a constant ball rolling. Many people though look at the concept of collecting raw materials and having to bring it all back to your studio and process it. It often ends there. Uh, there's a lot of work and a lot of time spent processing. It's grunt work, it's messy, and each material needs to be processed with its own method. I've been processing plant material, rocks, and clay. Plants are burned down into a fine ash, sieved, sometimes wash, and washed and included in a glaze slurry. They're called ash glazes. Rocks must be broken down into a fine powder, and clay must be refined to remove the sand, the rocks, and the roots. This image here is uh, the first time I burned some cannabis stalks to make a cannabis ash glaze. There's a lot of drying materials out, crushing it into fine powders, wetting it back down, running it through a screen and then a fine sieve, putting it in a ball mill, which is a large rotating container that with porcelain balls in it that grinds things up into a powder, sieving some more, ball milling, sieving, ball milling, sieving. It can take days to completely process a material and only after all of that is completed that you can put it in the kiln to see what it will do. But that processing and refining is satisfying as the materials become sieved and refined into a smooth powder. It's almost therapeutic. Ceramics itself is a discipline that happens as a love of process. It's lengthy. There are many different stages and your pieces can fail at any point during any of those stages but it's those finished pieces that are almost what you want that keep you going. These little jars were one of those moments. They were almost what I wanted and they launched me into the beginning to work on the recent showing that I had at Gallery 78. I've done a great deal of experiments with different materials and I'm always looking for more, although not always intentionally, I just find them. I do spend a lot of time 
uh, kayaking and hiking and just spending time outside and in nature. I think the reality of my crazy life makes the peace and the randomness appealing. These moments are inspirational and recharging. I love the way nature creates textures, lumps and bumps, smooth perfection and gnarled edges. I'm always collecting pretty rocks on the beach or some interesting looking sand. And when I'm making pots, I find the textures inspirational. I have found that it is important to always have some sort of container with you. Too many times I found myself trying to jam as much sand or seashells into a Tim Hortons coffee cup as I possibly can, only to have it spill out all over my car. My kayak becomes the ultimate clay container. It's regularly a mess, but I really don't care. The wonder of what it will look like when it's fired, what it what it can, what I can add to it to make it something. It's, it's incredible. It's an amazing thing. And when it works out into something interesting, it's all worth it. So last summer, my family went for a hike to Dunbar Falls in it's off of the Nashwalk River. It's a, it's the rough trail, but the reward at the end is amazing. It is, there are beautiful falls at the end where you can swim and you can have a picnic. <coughs> so on this walk, I reached out for balance while I was crossing a stream and I realized that I had my hand on some dried clay and it was purple. So I, of course, immediately started collecting it into my lunch bag. And yes, this was before the picnic. I brought it home and I refined it and I wedged it into some porcelain. It, of course, fired red orange as everything seems to. Um, but it added a richness to the pots, a sense of location, geography, and warmth. This pot here is completely local. Every material in it was something that I collected and processed. So my inspiration, as I've said, comes from time spent in nature. I have said I love hiking and and kayaking with my family. And this time together is peace and it's satisfying. I often find myself sitting on a rock or in the sand or grass, just enjoying the air, the trees, the water, and simply put the view. I like to listen to the sounds and pay attention to the patterns in the landscape. I love the natural rippled patterns that emerge on the beach from the tide the smoothness of the beach with rocks peeking through, the direction of the water having passed over, apparent through the trail left behind the rock. This reminds me of the tidal beach. It's a large platter with crushed slate in the center for decoration and a crawling glaze over top. A rocky beach with the rocks that peek through the sand this piece was shown and sold at the Making Waves show in uh, St. Andrews in 2018. And these are some mugs with granite inclusions in the clay body. You can see the iron melting out and blending with the covering glaze, sometimes making a bump and sometimes leaving a crater. And in the water, I found this algae one hot and sunny afternoon on the Nashwalk River, and I couldn't believe how fascinating it looked. It's disgusting, right? But it's kind of pretty with the sun reflecting off of it and the bubbles. And don't worry, I didn't collect it. I just appreciated its appearance. And I found similarities with my pots, with the algae and the bubbles and the slime these ones as well. In ceramics, there tends to be a connection to the earth regardless. All of our materials come from the earth. However, with purchased clay and purchased materials, that connection can be quite removed. The materials are mined around the world and shipped to you from your local supplier. Through collecting materials from the local geography, 
that connection is so blatant. The time spent in collecting, processing, and then designing and applying the materials to the pots creates a super satisfying and unique piece. I go back and forth in creating functional work and larger one-of-a-kind pieces. Although my more one-of-a-kind pieces are, fo are focused on function, they're just a little bigger and the glazes are a little less functional. And my functional work is completely all over the place. I used to do a specific line, but now that I'm teaching, I tend to experiment with different techniques, different clays, different styles, and different glazes. It keeps me able to help students who have very different interests than mine. So my functional, functional work tends to be a potpourri of glazes and glaze combinations. Some are from natural materials that I've harvested and processed and some are not. So my functional work tends to be, well, kind of one of a kind pieces as well, not production pieces. I just really love making pottery and my heart really lies in function. I make pots because I love using pots. I really love using pots. <laughs> so my sense of form is fairly curvy and feminine. I love pillowy curvy pots that have a sense of volume. And I vary my form somewhat. I tend to do fairly rounded forms with dents in the side or sand applied to the surface. The glazing can be variegated color, blending of glaze layers, drippy ash glazes that, um, that run over the sand and the rocks to smooth celadons and copper reds. I really love copper reds actually because I love how the color seems to grow in the glaze. This is a seaweed ash glaze. I do believe that was uh, from Minister's Island. I love the textures in the glaze and how you can see the running of the rivulets and the pooling and the throwing marks. This is also an ash glaze. The same, it's actually the same ash glaze. It's just uh, developed a lot of carbon trapping. So the gourds have come from a fascination with the curvaceousness and contrast between their forms. Some are perfect, smooth and round. Others are smooth and squashed, and others still are warty and gnarled. All beautiful and all from the same plant, but so different and so interesting. I also love the reflected textures from nature, the gritty sandy texture of a coarsely sieved ash glaze, the wartiness of coarse, and sand, coarse sand melting out from high temperature firing. I've been wedging rocks and sands of various grits or meshes right into the clay at cone six or 1200 degrees Celsius. Whether or not it melts out depends on the covering glaze. And at cone 10 or 1285 degrees Celsius, that sand will melt out into warts or bumps or craters and it will mix together over the top. I love seeing the iron from the rock or the sand melt out and blend into that covering glaze. And sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it will leave large coarse bumps decorating the side of the pot. I love the unpredictability of the inclusions in the clay, of throwing the form and testing my skill. Can I keep it the form that I want it to be? In some I appreciate the inclusions, the subtlety of those inclusions, and some I appreciate the excessiveness. So as I've mentioned, one of my, my one of a kind pieces tend to be focused completely on natural materials. I collect the materials often in smaller batches. Therefore the pieces themselves, while technically they could be reproducible, they aren't simply because I tend to move on to another material. Processing is such a big job and time is always an issue in my life that I tend to work in smaller batches. The final pieces for my showing at Gallery 78 this past fall are what follows. The preparation for the showing took me about two years. First starting with the forms, clay harvesting, and then a lot of glaze testing. 
the final pieces were all made during the COVID shutdown and fired in an electric kiln at cone six. These were preliminary pots uh, and the following ones are my favorite ones from the, from the show. Uh, this is a, a wood ash glaze. They're all fired to cone six and this pot uses a coarsely sieved ash glaze that leaves bumpy, almost an iron cooking pot like texture. And you can see all the lumps and bumps and warts. I like to call them warts just because they're cute. This is the same glaze on these pots as well. This is a white satin matte covering glaze over a porcelain cover jar with granite inclusions. The glaze actually pulled the iron out of the granite and also left some lumps and bumps and craters. A tall cover jar or urn with large amounts of coarse silica applied to the surface of the pot. It's a wood ash glaze. It's a mixed wood ash that came from our backyard fire pit. Nice summer of cozy warm fires. And this one is actually the same glaze, just a, a fairly a thicker application of the glaze. And anyone who knows ash glazes would see how dangerous this is, but sometimes I like living on the edge. And I made it. Look, the drip goes just barely to the end. I was trying to see what would happen if I put too much coarse granite on the side of this pot. And now I feel like it wasn't too much. I find that you always have to push a little too far in order to see what is enough and what is not enough. And this pot has granite glaze on the surface. It was made with my regular boxed cone six porcelain clay, but it does have an interesting story. I was uh, refinishing a cast iron pot, scrubbing the rust off of it as it had been left outside over the winter. And as I started to rinse it, I realized that I was dumping iron oxide down the drain and I could be using it in clay. So I began collecting the iron, despite my family around me going, what on earth are you doing? That's okay. Um, the beauty of getting the iron in this way is that it was not refined and it was not finely ground. It was chunky and it was interesting. So I wedged it into some porcelain and I threw this pot and then I began to apply it to the outside of the surface of the wet clay. The irregular speckles stayed firm with the granite glaze even though it has even in the thick drippy spots it stayed nice and firm and made some nice speckles. This one was my favorite pot out of the showing. The black ash glaze crawled just enough on the on the upper portion of the pot. The white clay stained with iron underneath peeking through almost glows. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is where I am now. It was the only one I could find. <laughs> so right now I only sell to one store, uh, Sue, La Sue Lawrence's gallery and hair salon, um, because that's really all I can supply right now. I just delivered and finished and delivered 300 mugs to the New Brunswick Union. And that took a lot of the COVID shutdown time as well. And I'm playing with marbling clays and layering glazes. I'm making a lot of mugs for Christmas right now and I'm still always looking for found materials in my adventures. And I plan to do a lot more experiments with the cannabis ash as I have uh, copious amounts of stalks that need to be burned. So as I draw to a close, I have these points that I would like to, I hope are takeaways from all of my, my talking and rambling on here. Try to approach life with a sense of humor, especially approach yourself with a sense of humor. 
Surround yourself with supportive people, people who prop you up and support you. Stay away from those who don't and always be one of those people who prop other people up rather than tear them down. Keep going and keep making, even when, oh, even when life takes a detour, keep your goals in sight. Reevaluate often and keep moving in the direction you want, even if they're baby steps. Thank you very much for hanging out with me. I will stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Liz. That's wonderful. Does anybody have, I haven't been checking the chat because I've just been talking. Does anybody have any questions or comments? There are some questions in there. Um, oh. Yeah. If you, you can open it, I can also read for you and help out here. So um, Mary Stewart says, how can you throw clay yeah. that has inclusions of sand or rocks? That's the first that, one. Yeah, sometimes it's uh, a little hard on your hands. You know, uh, I try not to use anything too coarse, but um, yeah, I, it throws you off center. You just got to keep on and hope that it works out. Sometimes I get cracks and things and it doesn't work, but for the most part, it's, uh, yeah, it's a challenge. <laughs> a test of skill, I guess, right? To keep yeah. that pot centered when it's got a big chunk in it. Um, I see Jo had a question too. She's um, here. Jo, over to you. Oh, I see. I see. Do, oh, I'll read it. Liz, as a student, I find I often have self-doubt and struggle with my, oh, my line of work. And what point did you overcome this? And how would you say you did overcome these feelings? Do you still struggle with this today? Absolutely. I don't think self-doubt ever goes away. Um, you just you just keep going and try and turn turn that off because no matter what you do you're always going oh is this what am i doing it, it, it's just always there and you gotta you gotta really just ignore it turn it away and and keep going talk to keeping those supportive people around you is also really helpful because it gives you that little okay okay i'm on the right track i can do this yeah thanks liz <laughs> anita has made a comment and observed no matter how successful everyone suffers from imposter syndrome so absolutely absolutely what do they mm -hmm. say make it fake it till you make it yeah uh, that's it yeah you just you just just do just you know you have your goals in your head and you know what you want to do and you just have to keep keep doing don't don't give up liz um people um i'm just looking jennifer lee has said she's loved uh hearing about your practice you. and uh, tracy austin has also thanked you they said that was a great presentation Awesome. Um, there was a question from Matt Cripps. He said, what's the next natural material you plan on exploring? <laughs> um, well, I'm really still looking for clays that are interesting. Um, I've been doing mixing of clays together to see if I can find something that will throw well and fire to a temperature that I want it to fire to. Uh, most things around here I find will fire to a really low temperature. They're earthenwares and that's fine, but it's not the temperature that I like to work at. Um, so I've been experimenting with mixing things together, different clays together. Um, I'm gonna be doing a lot of, I, like I said, I have this large amount of cannabis stocks that I have to burn down. So I think I'm gonna be doing some, some cannabis ash glazes, seeing what else I can come up with. So. Um, jo had uh, another question. She said she missed um, what, what it was you had retrieved for your glaze on that, uh, for the from the death <laughs> march. <laughs> Well, I got a little, I got some seaweed and I got some seashells 
on that trip. And the seaweed I burned down into an ash and I used in some glazes and the seashells, the processing of them is you just have to fire them to like a, a bisque temperature, it's like 950 degrees and then put them in a ball mill and they grind up into a powder and it's essentially calcium carbonate that, that you're using. Cool. So in glaze. basically you could really take any natural materials and grind them down and make them into a glaze. Absolutely. Cool. <laughs> yep. it, it will melt. If it will melt, then yeah. So um, uh, there's lots of comments and questions coming in. So I'm just going to read them through the list. Um, Mary Stewart says, given your love of glazes, have you ever made wall pieces or considered considered murals? I have not. I've done, mostly I've done some some flared bowls with, with stuff in them to, you know, different glazes and different inclusions, but I haven't done any, any big, anything really overly huge. I think a mural would be super fun. It would be. Um, Next, uh, Kirsten Cooper has said uh, she loves hearing about your time on Indigenous visual arts and how it influenced the way you connected with natural materials and it's very cool. Yeah. And Anisha then goes on to ask specifically, what's your favorite adjective or inclusion? Uh, I find granite is the most interesting because it, it melts and there's so many different kinds so they melt at different uh, different temperatures and they give different colors, the different types of granite. There's, um, well, I mean, before, before when you see it on the beach or in the ground or whatever, it's, it can be gray or pink, you know, it's sort of mottled. And uh, the, the pink ones are actually a potas have more potassium in them and the gray ones have more soda in them. So they do different things. And when you grind it up into a powder you can use it in a glaze but when it's chunky you can use it as inclusions in your clay and they will they'll melt out and do some interesting things to your glaze wonderful yeah there's uh three other comments that have come in i'm just wondering would those people like to read them themselves i'm happy to do so but um the next one on the list would be marilyn marilyn if you'd like to voice that yourself I'm just uh, so lucky, Liz, to have uh, a beautiful uh, piece that you've made in my home uh, that I purchased recently, and uh, it just um, brings the New Brunswick natural environment into my home and gives me a sense of place in this place. So awesome. thank you. Keep making. Thank Thanks, Marilyn. And I like that she said at the end of her comment, she says, keep making this amazing art. And I think that goes back to what you mentioned about the cheerleaders. Like yeah. we need to keep those people who build us up close. Um, my own personal experience has been that often that's not your family and friends. <laughs> and, and not that it's because I don't believe them because they're always encouraging. They're very supportive. And so my, my, my objective artist brain goes, aha, but they would say nice things anyway. So for me, uh, those people who build me up within my practice are my colleagues here and other artists that I, I feel like I always flee to when I have problems, like when I want help and solutions. True. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's uh, some other comments here. Matt has said it's awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Jen Lee has said your curiosity about materials is inspiring, Liz. Uh, sense of play mixed with glazing chemistry science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like to, um, I, I, I just really like to experiment and, and see what happens. I find, you know, working with the students is, is really great for that too because they're always experimenting and looking at things or even asking questions like what will happen if i do this like try it see you got to see because that's your best your best way of learning is to just see what happens yeah and yeah this i'm also interested in your pivot from your original master's degree 
<laughs> I know. know, it seems like a whole other life ago. It really does. Um, well, I, I, you know, I did, I did went to university and I studied anthropology and I've always, I've always been the person that just, I, I, I go where I like what I'm doing. And my problem has always been, I love everything. I would take a class at university and I'd love this and I'd love this. And then once I found anthropology, I was just, okay, this is great. I'm going to do this. So I, I just kept going. Um, and then um, when I finished my BA, I, I took a year because I, I decided I'm going to do a master's degree in anthropology because that would be good. I didn't know really what I wanted to do with my life. So I took a year because everything seemed so, those applications just seemed so daunting. And I took a ceramics course here at the college with Peter Thomas. And yeah, I was hooked, completely hooked. And then I started, I got my acceptance letter at Concordia and realized, oh, I have to make a decision. And then they gave me, um, a, a, I can't, what's it called? A, a grant, a student, like a teaching position, a student teacher teaching position. And so I was like, oh, well, I have to go now. Like that's, that's pretty cool. So off I went to, to Montreal for two years and I took all my pots with me and I used them every day. And, you know, I, I mean, I dove into to my degree head first and I, and I followed what I loved there. I, I, and it was all art related. I was looking at my original thesis was supposed to look at um, the designs people chose for tattoos and where they placed them and how and why and try and figure out some sort of connection with all of that and then I met um, I met a guy who was a brander and whew, there I went off into all this extreme body modification and found myself hanging out in some interesting places for a few months and wrote my thesis but as as soon as I came back I found myself signed up in uh, in first year ceramics. Yep, <laughs> it just um, I don't know. It was just I I I I had to make. I just wanted to make, and I really couldn't see myself in a a university um, academic institution. The, the thought of doing a PhD in anthropology was there. And, you know, I thought, well, you know, but that's a, that's a 10 year commitment doing a, a PhD in anthropology, because first of all, you have to spend a year doing a participant observation, and then you have to go write it and you're teaching and it's, you know, there's, there's a lot, a lot to it. And I, I didn't love the culture at university. I didn't, uh, I didn't love that. So, and when I came here, uh, I mean, NBCCD is such a great place to be. You, you, you just feel like you belong here. And then I started making pots and I started using pots and oh my goodness, the possibilities. So yeah, I was hooked. <laughs> yeah, you followed your gut, obviously, right? Like that's, yep. yeah, through a yep. lot. Yeah. I think too, there's a, a lot of parallels with the kind of amount of um, uh, testing and science and rigor and investigation and hard evidence, all of that stuff that you have to put into your materials, gathering them, processing them, testing them. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, um, it equates to the same level of rigor. And I think for many of us who even, you know, we, we sometimes enjoy the thinking and the acquisition of new knowledge, because that can be like really exciting. But I've also found that I missed the embodiment. Like I need something grounded. I want something real to make and do and to hold and to give purpose to the thoughts that I think and the expressions of ideas and all of that new knowledge. So yeah. I find that 
it's not always that we veer away from things that are more intellectual or academic, but rather we're able to kind of seam both of those worlds um, together to produce real uh, physical, tangible objects as well. So that is so true. Yeah, that is so true. Um, I always found that I, you know, I like theory and I like science, but I found the the tangibleness of and the practicality of putting it in a kiln, seeing what it will do, and then being able to take it out and eat your yogurt from it. It's just yeah. <laughs> amazing. <laughs> yeah. uh, There's uh, some new comments that have come in. Um, Grace Boyd, uh, uh, and probably I think Susan might be there too, says, thank you, Liz, stunning research. And uh, Carrie Nolan has uh, a longer comment too. Carrie, do you want to voice your comment. Sure, I just said that the cough hit the kayak pot that made me tell. We're all on mute while you're uh, presenting, but to uh, just, I did have a chuckle over here um, and just that there's the blend between your recreation and your gathering uh, and just all hearing you talk about the pieces. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I, I find, um, I think it's a, maybe it's a ceramics thing. We, we tend to live our, live our, our practice a lot. I think it, it's, I don't know. I'm not sure why we just, it's, it's maybe because there's so many processes and you're always multitasking. And so no matter what you're doing, you're like, are my pots drying? Am I going to get to them on time? I have to put a handle on that. So you're constantly going from here to here. So then when you start, you know, you, you go out on a kayak trip, you're like, whoo, I see some clay or it's, it's just, I think it becomes so ingrained in your everyday experience that it, it, you can't separate it anymore. So it's just, and, and my family is, has become a part of that too. They'll be like, Oh, let's, let's get some shells for mom. So <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Liz, could you talk a bit about uh, the workshop environment? It's something that's kind of fascinated me and coming from a printmaking background where I had spent many years in a collective print workshop. So it was like a hive, many people moved and worked. And when I was in the early stages of learning processes, when I was fixed at one particular part, I actually could see people in the same environment that were on stage one and were on stage 10 at the very end of that process. and so being being within a, a section of part of that kind of longer process, I was able to have a sense of a bigger picture um, and also the bigger picture of how I sat within a community like we were all there together working way. Um, and I think that that benefited me hugely in how I approach everything projects work. I'm just wondering, is that something that is meaningful and important to you in your process? The workshop environment. The workshop environment. I'm not sure I know what you mean by that term workshop environment. I guess being in a studio you're not working alone you're frequently oh. uh, potters are in places where other potters are and they share resources and like a studio space like you're in now. Absolutely yeah it's I found you know being in this environment is it has so much of a community. We all are always bouncing ideas off of each other. Everybody is always discussing what they're working on, how they're working on it. What should I do here? What do you think of this? And it really helps to feed your own practice. It, it's, it's, a constant, it's a constant dialogue. So it's, it's amazing. And then when you go into your own studio by yourself, like when when I was a student here and I left, I missed that unbelievably because it was just me in my studio trying to navigate everything. And I had nobody to say, what do you think of this teapot? Mm. It was just me. So, you know, you, you don't get that feedback. Um, yeah. And, you know, you, you're getting feedback from customers in your shop but it's not the same. It's not the same to get uh, somebody who gets what you do to really say, hey, you know what, that's, 
spout we were talking about spouts earlier that spout is too big or whatever you know yeah you need that and it's i i find in our in our world it's so so important yeah i've observed that too that the potters seem to grow quite close and that those relationships that are built within the studio exist and expand beyond the walls of the college afterwards it's like a wonderful supportive tight-knit community absolutely yeah it is a it is a great group because you can you know potters will share their glaze recipes you could email someone across the country and say hey i saw a picture of your your pot and I really like that what's your recipe and they'll probably give it to you <laughs> because it's just it's a I don't know it's just a really kind community sharing and giving I remember Tomo when she shared about her practice last year at Momi Ingalls she had mentioned how even in building a kiln when they made an outdoor firing it required like there were three or four people working on it for like you know, days on end to build and to, you know, apply the wood and to make sure the fire was going. So it was like, it took a village. It does. And often you'll find, uh, oh, I remember doing this when I was new, like newly, newly graduated. Uh, Darren Emino, he had a wood kiln and my husband and I, we would just, we'd go and help him fire just because. And what do you get in return? You could put a pot in my kiln. And that's awesome because the experience of firing is really great. And you all get together and you have a good time and you have a meal and yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. We have about one minute left. I'm just looking um, if there's anybody else that has any comments or questions before we go to the end and wrap up. Jen says she's looking forward to sharing the recording of this presentation with her niece in Texas. So she's, uh, yeah, taking ceramics and biology. So that's a, a, a oh, wonderful no. intersection of both of those. So I'm sure she's going to love your presentation. Awesome. I see uh, Matt asking when MBCCD is going to get a wood kiln. Oh, I'm, I'm hoping someday. That would be amazing. Yeah. Well, thanks to everybody. Um, uh, I'm going to hand us back to Audrey. Um, just before that, I think my takeaway today, you've reminded me of, uh, you know, Paulo Freire, the great Brazilian educator who coined the term of like student, teacher, teacher, student. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, we're all learning. We're all in a position. And I know that for the time as a parent and a, a mother and everything else that I've had to give up to have children and also to be teaching full time from my practice I feel like I've gained just as much if not more because I'm continuously learning I feel like a student and so it feeds my yes. my need for knowledge um yeah so thank you so much for for sharing your work and your practice today I'm going to hang hand us back to Audrey thank you Elizabeth Demerson you were truly an inspiration to me I really enjoyed all your pictures and you talking about your process and how you integrate both, you know, your practice upstairs and IVA and your ceramics as well. I enjoyed that. And thank you to all of our guests as well for attending. And next week's talks on November 26 is Tracy Austin speaking on fashion as a craft and the creative process. Well, we won. Thank you all. Thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. Bye, folks. Bye. Bye.